Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks. It's great to be here. Uh, this talk's more of a uh, slightly out of sequence and is more of a, a case study, so it's light on theory and more about results and process. But please ask anything at the end of the presentation. Hopefully, this time for a lot of questions. So it's about uh, machine learning on uh, seismic data in the Norwegian North Sea. This is work we carried out with uh, Conical Phillips, who is one of our, our partners in the Petromax, our Petromax R&D project. The, uh, the data was supplied by PGS, so thanks to them. And I'll just mention the data set now. So we have a nice uh, seismic data set for this study, 700, uh, 7,000 kilometers squared, 55 gigabytes per stack, so this is an extensive seismic volume. And we've got a full range of uh, stacks available and also the interval velocity cube that we can also, also leverage. So one of the big benefits about uh, machine learning and being able to apply machine learning with modern tools is the ability to work at data with scale, at scale. And work at a scale that previously we may not have considered, considered at all and it may not have been actually feasible, but now we can start testing what it's like to use large amounts of data within machine learning models, bring large amounts of data from wells, combine that in order to make predictions at seismic scale over, over larger regions than we've been able to before. And that's an aim of ours, to figure out how to do that and uh, what, what it means. And we're presenting results today from work on that area for rock properties. So I'm not going to go too much into to details, but uh, Anders uh, mentioned cross-validation testing. And just throughout all the work that we, you're going to see in the presentation, this is something we do at, at absolutely every step. So we, everything we do is based off empirical blind cross-validation. So whenever we have a, a, a set of data, we will do multiple model runs holding out, for example, in the case of well data, always holding out entire wells as blind sets and we round robin in order to uh, get an assessment of how, uh, how well a, a model is performing. We then eventually retrain on the whole data to be able to use all of our data, but uh, the cross-validation gives us a way to uh, assess model performance and, and tune. So all the scores you've seen will be today from, from, from that. The workflow overall is data preparation, cleaning, and conditioning. And we've got an advantage of we've got a huge amount of well data already cleaned and, and, and prepped as, as part of our, our work at Earth Science Analytics. And so we use that. And first, the next step is to create well-scale predictions. So we take uh, predictions from uh, lift labels and cores and use that to create dense wireline log information. Uh, in this case, we've used classical LML models for that. It's well-scale well -scale predictions are well-established and uh, is quite reliable with uh, classical ML models. And then we take that data and move up to the seismic scale where we apply deep neural networks in 1D and 3D in order to, uh, in order to try to predict those same rock properties over seismic data. So, quick overview of the area. The, the focus areas at the bottom of the Viking Graben, it's the Sleipner Vest and Sleipner Ost fields. We can see the outline of the survey, which is quite extensive and captures them well. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the uh, second, uh, the, the vertical shoreline to the left, which is a cross line right the way through the, the Sleipner Vest field. And we've got some results to show later in the presentation on that. So, if we start from the, the core labeling process. So, here for this project, what we've done is we've pulled in overall 400 wells from the NCS database uh, that stretch up over the, over the Viking Graben, so within the, the, the same structural setting as the, our area of interest. And then we go in and we can look at, uh, we can do various things with those wells. So we can enrich our VP, VS, and existing wireline log data by doing end painting and extend, extending that and improving the extent of all our available wirelines. And then we can go on and use uh, data from cores and, uh, and labels to, uh, to predict rock properties and, and, and fluid properties. And today we're focusing on specifically uh, lift and uh, porosity estimates. So this picture is actually a 
sort of histogram of all of our wells, and then the proportion of wells where we had core measurements at some interval. Uh, so what we hope to do is uh, train models over this entire area, the benefits from all of that geology, and then use that, those models to predict uh, continuous logs that we're going to then apply on a small area of this, in a smaller region of the south of the, of the gravel. So just to say something about uh, labels and where the ground truth information is coming from. So our core porosities are obviously heavily biased towards the reservoir intervals. So we end up looking at uh, histograms like this. If we plot out our core porosities versus and color them up with the actual lithologies, the, the, therefore, we always see the sandstone uh, is, is, uh, is dominant, and we have a big bias towards the reservoir interval. That's something we have to deal with. On the lithology classes, in this case, we actually used a, 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 a TGS label set. And again, we have the, the histogram on the right showing the, uh, the class balance in, in that data set as, as we get it. So again, there, there's some balancing that we could do uh, and to, to address the, the, in, the inequalities in the, in, in the label set. So if we just look at uh, core porosity prediction, so here we're focusing in on one well, and we're looking on the left at a, a predicted porosity curve, and the uh, green dots are the, the plugs themselves. So we can see down at the reservoir interval, we can get uh, a quite good prediction, very well, very, very conformant with, uh, with, with the ground truth. And um, on the other plots, and not all the wire lines used in the predictions, but just some of the, the key, key wire lines, gamma ray density, DT. And we can just see how uh, the, uh, the predictions react in some of the kicks within there. Especially all the eyes always drawn at the spike up there, which is lines up with our density and uh, velocity kicks that we see in the data. So we're able to make uh, reliable estimates across the wells. And in terms of scores, we see we see regression scores in the 80s and 90s over, over those intervals, uh, uh, which is which is ve very good performance. Our question then becomes, how do we move out of those intervals? So what we do in our workflow is uh, we have our core data points in the left histogram, and this is illustrative with the scales, etc. So we have our core data points, and we need to increase uh, the number of data points that we have for porosity, for example, and we do that by using CPI labels. So what we do is we, we select some select CPI labels outside of the sandstone intervals to increase the data coverage along the stratigraphic column and also to increase and also to balance out the data set. So we get more porosities and shales, coals, limestones, etc. So that gives us a, an increase in our label quality. We then uh, take that data and again, imagine this is again the, the CPI and the core data points uh, over all of our wells. We then use the machine learning models to predict and infer porosity uh, on all of those wells. And then this turns this cross plot into something like this, where you can see the density increase in information. So we're going from the order of tens of thousands of points up to you know, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of points when you start uh, involving 400 wells. So this gives us a, a huge uh, amount of data to work at, at well scale. And it also allows us to create rock property curves like this, which are continuous, running all the way down the, uh, down the stratigraphic column at all the intervals of interest. And you can see at the bottom where our core uh, intervals are. So what we've got is we've got models that have been trained to reproduce, uh, select good quality CPI, and also honor blind ground truth measurements. So we combined the, we combined all the inv available information to get the best possible prediction over a large scale. Okay, so I'm going to move on to to seismic now. So we've uh, we've trained on all this well data, and the real reason for doing that and creating, using as much well data as possible is to make these models that we've used to predict wells in our focus area as reliable as possible. So it's been trained on uh, lots of data from right the way up the graph, like in Graben. So then uh, 
seismic scale, of course, were limited. So we actually had 44 wells, I think, in total in our, uh, in our, in our seismic area. And we excluded some. We excluded deviated wells. Deviated wells are still the challenge. They don't, they don't blind test well. And uh, so we excluded those. And then a number of other wells were excluded based you know, for quality and sort of time, <coughs> time to depth correlation issues. And that left us with about, I think, 35 wells that we could actually train on. Then we were challenged about uh, how do we test. We wanted to get the blind, best blind test possible. So we s split our CV manually and basically ensured that we had a uniform distribution across our fields for every round robin test. That's just to make sure, try to get the uh, statistics in our test wells to balance with uh, the statistics in our, in our training data for every run. And then we went ahead and applied networks to that and did a lot of training and tuning in order to, uh, in order to select the best model and the best <coughs> hyperparameters. Now these are our scores for a, a particular model runs out of that process for porosity and for lithology. And I've put the uh, porosity scores on the map. So the porosity scores, really the best scores are up in the sort of 50s to 60s of explained variance. 50 to 60% doesn't sound great, but I'll show you what that means on the next slide. And uh, this is actually reasonably good for, for porosity, that we have a good spread of uh, scores up that high, and all of our scores are, are positive. There's a few complete failures, and actually there's another sidetrack well down here that's down red. But you can see distribution of uh, high scores is pretty good over the fields. Uh, Lith, lithology classification always tends to be easier than the whole in, than the regression problem, and so we have very good F1 scores up in the 70s and above uh, for our lithology predictions. And I have to say these are blind blind scores, so we've trained on a subset of wells, and these wells are far away. Well, you saw the area; these wells are, have n have never been used in the training, so I was think that getting blind performance in a different region of seismic on an unseen well is, is, uh, is, is, is very good. So what does that mean? So if we focus on the, 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 the two left plots, sorry, the two plots on the far right, we have our target and predicted lithologies, uh, and we can see we have good, pretty good correlation there. Uh, interesting, we've got uh, some of the injectites. They're the black dotted line is the Heimdall top, We've got some of the injectites in the grid formation above, and we're predicting the big sand of the Heimdall. The porosity curve, that's what 54% e explained variance looks like. So we're, we track very well the, uh, the main trend, but uh, metrics are difficult when you have this amount of variation in the signal. The, the scores are easily thrown off by the small amount of variation. So metrics on this stuff is something we still have to work on a lot. And it's good that it's uh, be able to pick up some of the injectites some of the thicker ones anyway, but it's, we're, not, we're not getting to these thinner intervals yet. So we're happy that we've got sort of a base trend of porosity being predicted. And I've also shown sort of AI and density in VPS because on the way we should be able to, of course, predict elastic properties well before making the, the jump to the, the rock properties. So it's nice to see that those curves are also conformant. So we're gonna have a look quickly at some data and this is a shoreline uh, going north-south through the, the Sleipner West field, which is in the Heimdall region there. This data set quality is very good, and uh, we're able to get some very good results. So this is the porosity prediction right the way down that end line. And remember, this is only trained at well locations, and then our blind, we have a good tie-in with, uh, with, with the wells themselves. We've predicted porosity right across the Heimdall quite well. Down below into the Triassic and Jurassic, we get some things picked up, but down here we really start to get out of well control and the seismic character changes significantly. So we have to weight those, those estimates down. But what's really encouraging as well is we get lots of stable activity in the, uh, in the, in the injectites up in the, in the grid formation, which is really, really encouraging. So we're able to produce a very good large scale uh, porosity estimate. Again, with the lithology, the lithologies are picked up very well. Uh, uh, depth wasn't a feature in here, 
uh, with the stacks and the and the velocity model, and we get very good uh, we get very good uh, conformance to the the main her main horizons. We're predicting too many sands down below, definitely. So that's something that, that needs looked at. But uh, up in the target intervals, we're getting very good very good predictions, and some of the sands and the eject outs being picked up as well. So this gets a bit more colourful, but our, our acoustic impedance as well uh, shows very high. So it, it gives us a, oh, sorry. We, so we can predict elastic properties as well. The scores for elastic properties are higher than the porosities. We're seeing them in the sort of 80s. And we're able to sort of reliably bring out also acoustic impedance, VPVS, and density, which are all quite uh, uh, effective. So that's sort of property prediction and producing sort of elastic inversions, if you like, from neural networks directly by using in, in situ data from, from wells and the seismic, which is a very different approach to any of our current inversion work. And compared to inversion workflows, it's extremely fast. Some of these networks you're talking about training times in uh, half an hour in order to do a model run and predictions over a 55 gigabyte cube within within two hours on a, on a, on a normal workstation. So these things uh, work, we continue to improve them, but uh, the, the advantages of being able to use this method will sort of be transformative in terms of the way we can rapidly generate property cubes like this. So what I really wanted to leave you with is uh, we can take, we can use machine learning to help us to take our measurements from core all the way up to seismic by helping us being data driven, increase the data density in our data sets all the way through, and we can produce, we can use them to produce predictions at seismic scale. Reduce cycle time, that's all about the speed that, the, that we're able to apply these models. Really, we could carry out this work within a matter of a couple of weeks and turn this around, including enriched well data and, and, uh, and inverted cubes. Uh, we can use all of the data uh, that we have in the process, which is which is fantastic, and you know create these property volumes on a large scale that we wouldn't be use, usually ask out of an inversion workflow. And plus, we've taken out a lot we're, because we're being data driven and it's empirical. We're allowing uh, more generalists, so more general geoscientists, to be able to get involved in this work because we're. we're we're elevating them to the specialist because now more people can get involved directly in, in porosity prediction and lithology prediction than, than is possible with traditional petrophysics and uh, inversion workflows. So that was everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.